Hi there, welcome everybody. Um, I am delighted to be joined today by Chris Barris, Group Treasurers at Hunting, to uh, talk about driving treasury innovation. So uh, Chris, welcome, uh, great to see you. Thanks for taking the time. Um, I know it's been a, a long career for you at Hunting, spanning um, a little over 20 years, Nin 1999, my little notes tell me. So um, back right. a, a little whippersnapper back then, I guess. And then um, 21 years at Hunting and then 12 as, as group treasurer. So um, I guess you were pretty young when you were made a GT. I was 30, actually, yeah. So I was uh, still a little bit wet behind the ears, as they say. But uh, no, it's been a great experience um, working with hunting and many more years to come, I hope. And I guess as a, a younger treasurer coming off the back of the last um, financial crisis, you've had 12 years um, of sort of witnessing this, I guess, financial technology or fintech boom that's happened um, across finance, but also specifically across mm. treasury. And I know you've always been really keen to, um, to engage in technology, to engage in innovation and to try and drive innovation at hunting forward in multiple different areas over that sort of 12 year tenure. I wonder if you could just start by giving us a bit of information on how you've thought about innovation in treasury, what's driven it, why, um, you know, why you think it's helpful for the, for the treasury team, but also for the broader organization as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, the, the important thing is that we've always tried to detect the themes and trends in the treasury tech space, you know, trying to identify projects that have got some longevity rather than innovating for the sake of just innovating. Um, in, in our case, the main focus has been uh, leveraging the functionality that's available through our treasury management system with a focus on implementing solutions that address a specific need, whether that's reducing risk or reducing costs, uh, improving transparency, control or efficiency, uh, and looking to integrate platforms and processes as well. So, you know, with the, the underlying objective of really being able to do more with less, which I think is a pressure that a lot of us feel a lot of the time, Kevin. Yeah, no, that's certainly a theme that we get a lot from, from our clients, um, is that efficiency. Do you think it's changed over the last 12 years sort of in terms of uh, availability or proliferation of solutions mm. or, or in terms of your own personal attitude to adopting them or, or even more in terms of the broader firm's um, attitude to adopting new technology that's, to innovate? It's a good question. I think both, I think firms generally over that period of time have become more attuned to uh, the idea that technology has a, a bigger role to play in, in process improvement, as I said, through transparency and control and risk control, especially um, within hunting as well. You know, our own perspective on, on, on how we deliver and implement tech based solutions as part of the overall business um, evolution has changed as well. And there's definitely a, a, a more open mind as a business as to how we approach a project and and look at it on its own merits and, and decide whether there's there's scope to to invest and, and deploy some value yeah and i think that's an interesting point because obviously having ideas about technology you want to implement as a, a group treasurer or a member of the treasury team is one thing but actually getting them implemented um, and approved and signed off by people who you know potentially are within treasury but also potentially people who, are, who aren't within treasury um, interesting to to hear you talk a little bit about how you position those innovation product projects internally and um, how you try and maximize the chances of getting buy into them I guess the, the the starting point is always to ensure that you're implementing a project that's addressing a certain need or, or a deficiency somewhere either in your existing systems environment or if there is a, a risk that you feel isn't adequately contained or identified. So it's designing a project that's addressing a specific requirement rather than trying to create an issue that's not there so that you can innovate for the sake of innovation. So it's having that that transparency, that visibility through the process to understand the starting point and the end game and, and what's uh, and how you're going to deliver that throughout and then it's being able to convey that messaging succinctly to the input you know the major stakeholders within the business to the management team um, in a way as you say that to, for some people that aren't necessarily treasury um, versatile or, or have that, that that understanding of the treasury scope um, so it's got to be pitched in a manner that's that's universally understandable um, and one way that We've had success there. The, the way I try to approach these conversations is to look at a project to begin with in terms of how it delivers value for Treasury 
uh, along the lines of what we talked about, risk, cost efficiency, cost control, et cetera, but then try to understand how that might also add value in other aspects of the business, other areas of the business, maybe within a, a, another subset of the finance function or, or, or legal or company secretarial. And there are examples of that where we've had some success as well. And, and that helps to get buy-in obviously from the, from the wider business and, and ultimately to, to unlock the budget that's needed to invest. So to try and convince people to take a more holistic view, you have to take a, a broader view yourself rather than just being a, this is treasury, this is my problem, this is what I need to solve it. It's trying to understand, okay, I've got a problem in treasury, but how else might the tool that I'm using to solve that problem also be applied to other bits of the business? Yeah, and I think that talks to the, the innovation that's going on in the tech space. You know, a lot of these tools that are coming to the market now aren't necessarily designed specifically just for treasury or specifically just for finance. They have multiple use in business cases. And I think that's a, an important uh, part of what these uh, system vendors have, have acknowledged is that there is likely to be a better uptake if there can be uh, you know, multiple use cases through an organization of their system software. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So maybe um, moving on to some of those use cases, some of those ways in which you've particularly particularly implemented new um, treasury solutions in order to drive that innovation and uh, maybe even start with some of the earlier ones from sure. and then work through to the, the more recent. Well going all the way back to the beginning I guess the journey for us started when uh, back in 2009 um, when we decided to uh, aim for swift connectivity so we were one of the first 200 UK corporates to sign up for SWIFT corporate access, initially on the MACUG, the member administered closed user group model, and then more latterly on the, on the SCORE model. And what that did is that enabled us to connect directly with our um, number of banks that we've got around the globe, gave us visibility of our balance and transaction reporting, allowed us to initiate payments on a bank agnostic basis. Uh, and the benefits that delivered for us, obviously, as a, tre as a treasury department, are, 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 are relatively obvious. We have much greater visibility and control over our cash as a business on a, on a truly global basis. But it also enabled us to push down some of those benefits to our subsidiaries, to our business units, allowed them, allowed them to manage their intercompany loan balances more effectively, which meant they could drive down their, their internal costs as well. Um, so that was, that was a real game changer for us because it's on that foundation of the swift connectivity that we've put in place that we've been able to develop other projects as well so we're we're now looking at gpi for example the global payments initiative uh, that's going to deliver to us all sorts of additional benefits around managing um, bank account fees and not a, as well as track and trace of our payments uh, we're building out again using that swift uh, connectivity as a foundation um, some of our real-time position analysis tools some auto reconciliation functionality as well. Uh, so that's, I guess, a bit of an evolution of the, the SWIFT implementation that we've done. Um, more recently, thinking just, about... I'll stop you, just because I think it's interesting on the SWIFT piece, because I think um, the there's a couple of things you said. One, GPI, I agree, I think it's going to be really interesting for, um, for people. I think everybody who's um, watching, I'm sure, will have experienced the pain of either A, sending wires and having no idea where they've gone or which corpus on the banking system they're lost in, um, or B, sending one amount and finding that another amount turns up and you're not entirely sure where the difference has gone along the way. And I think GPI will definitely be really helpful in you know, we'll be able to save those. But the other thing that you mentioned was, um, you know, that that particular solution enabled you to build upon it. You know, the originally you needed the swift connectivity in order to be able to even think about having GPI and then to look at the other things that, um, that you're doing. So, to what extent, I guess, as you were looking through the last 10 years and, and going forward, is there, a, okay, this is the blocking item that I need. This is the thing that is going to enable me to do these other things. And so even in a, if something might in and of itself add value, is it the case that really you're also looking to what else can I build on with that? What else can I do in the future with this new bit of transparency or technology or efficiency or whatever that I've just gained? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that I had the foresight uh, that, that investing in the SWIFT connectivity all those years ago would deliver the GPI fun functions that we're hopeful to get at some later stage. But uh, some of it is, is predetermined, uh, Kevin. Um, some of it really just comes with staying up, up to date with how the technology that we've already implemented is evolving. 
uh, a good example of that is our treasury management system. And they're constantly developing new functionality and modules that we've then embraced and embedded within our systems and process infrastructure. So for example, we've recently implemented a netting solution, uh, intercompany payments netting solution. And that's been very, very successful. It's really helped us push down uh, intercompany transaction costs. It's improved our visibility of intercompany uh, account balances. So some of it is pre-designed pre uh, and there's an expectation that if you implement, implement something that is a, likely to be a bedrock of a process or a procedure going forward, there will be an opportunity to enhance that functionality. Um, it's not always the case, but in, in SWIFT for us has been a real boon in that respect um, because it just opens the door to, to so many other different types of functionality. And in some respects, actually, it's driven other changes as well because as a SWIFT member, you know, we have to now comply with the CSP, the customer security protocols. Uh, and in the last two or three years, that's really changed how we've had to construct our IT uh, and our TMS systems infrastructure. And it's forced through lots of changes in regards to uh, system security. And we've now got multi-factor authentication on payments. We've got a completely um, segregated treasury systems environment, it's completely separate logically and uh, physically to the rest of the head office systems infrastructure. So. We've now got a, a very secure systems environment, which again has stemmed from the fact that we invested in the SWIFT connection uh, all those years ago. Yeah, I think it's always the great thing about technology, isn't it? You sort of, whether you, it's in you know, retail lives, you buy an app on the app store and it just gets better because that, that's the, the job of the developer to keep making improvements the entire time. Or indeed with some of the sort of heavier weight B2B tech that we see today, you sort of, you, you're investing in it on the basis that you expect it to innovate and improve. and that to deliver additional value going forward. Um, so we talked a bit about maybe some of the things that you thought about doing and uh, the reasons for doing them and that sort of, I guess, preemptive um, innovation. What about just briefly, obviously we are hoping that we're coming out the other side of the pandemic now. Um, you know, what about that sort of uh, reactive innovation, things that have had to change for you at hunting on the back of the fact that COVID obviously forced everybody to working remotely in a completely different environment for payment approvals and all of those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, luckily for us, you know, it's not just Treasury that's had some investment at hunting. Our whole systems environment has been overhauled over the last, I'd say, five to 10 years. So we've now our setup was already very well designed and lends itself very well to remote working. Uh, and so that business continuity piece had already been covered off by the wider business. And so uh, our experience during the COVID pandemic has actually been a very good one, I would say, in terms of our ability to connect and rely on our systems infrastructure. Um, so that's been a, a, a real lifesaver uh, in many respects. Um, coming out the other side, um, I guess there's still some uncertainty in, in, in the marketplace, um, regardless of, of what sector that you're in. And so one system or solution that we've implemented allows us to have a much more uh, dynamic view of our credit exposures to financial institutions, uh, as well as uh, understanding um, the, the, the credit risk exposures that we have, both in our customer base and our supply chain. So this is uh, on the assumption that there's still some challenges out there, I think some headwinds, uh, as we come out of the, the, the back end of the COVID pandemic. Um, so that's an, a, an example of a system implementation that we've, we've had some success with. In terms of process and procedure, um, some, you know, some simple things, you know, in terms of payment approval, as you, um, I think, mentioned, Kevin, you know, a, a colleague of mine implemented the use of electronic signatures uh, on, on Adobe Acrobat, and that's been a real... Um, addition to our, our, our tools, I guess, our tool set. And it's worked very, very well. We've also relied more heavily on simple things like email to provide authority to, to move monies around as well. So it's not always looking for a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Sometimes the, the, the tried and tested ways work very well as, as well. Yeah, I think hopefully one thing that will come out on, uh, of all of this is there'll be um, a bunch less paper knocking around, whether it be in uh, corporate treasury teams or in fund administration or some of those areas that historically there's been an awful lot of things printed out and physically signed and I guess there's probably been no need to do that for more than a decade but sometimes it takes um, an exogenous shock like um, the pandemic to really force people to, to go and change those things and that's obviously good with the, in, uh, uh, the ESG trend that everybody's pushing towards as well. 
Um, just going back to the, the credit um, item that you mentioned. Uh, so that I think is with our friends at Credit Benchmark, um, the, the guys over there who are taking that bank sourced credit data and um, allowing clients to get a different view away from the rating agencies as to uh, what the credit of a particular underlying institution might be like. Is that an example of one of those areas that is useful for Treasury, but also potentially has implications or applications for, for the broader group? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we we as a business are currently cash positive, so we are investing cash, managing a, an active cash portfolio. And so, I took the view that uh, an overhaul of our investment policy was required last year. Uh, and this was again in, in recognition of the fact that there's additional risks coming through related to the COVID pandemic and and uh, the uncertainty that was out there in the marketplace. And so, historically, we've relied very heavily, as, as many people do, on, on credit rating agency views, and they have a place. Uh, but we felt we needed a more dynamic view of, of what was going on, not just within the, the financial services sector and the financial institutions that we place money with, but in our supply chain amongst our customer base as well. Um, and I became aware of the credit benchmark platform um, when uh, we were talking to various colleagues who were uh, exploring the idea of the COVID corporate finance facility back in March, April time of last year. And we, we became aware that it was the uh, credit benchmark platform that the Bank of England and HM Treasury were using to validate credit applications from, from companies coming through. So we thought we would take a look at that and, and see what it was all about. Um, and it showed, it, it demonstrated to me that there was exactly what you just said, Kevin, multiple uses, multiple applications of this platform. We could, it's got... Uh, excellent coverage of the of the sector um, for us as a in energy services space and obviously amongst the financial institutions as well. So I was able to package that up and say to my, my colleagues, here is a solution that will enable us to track and monitor the credit of our uh, investments that we're making as well, and also to check whether there's been any deterioration in our customer base or our supply chain and model that accordingly. And it's also enabled us to um, introduce some other processes around uh, risk adjusting the return on the uh, investments that we've made as well. So we've ended up with an investment policy that uh, looks at the credit benchmark solution and uses it in different ways across the business. Um, yeah, no, really interesting platform and um, firm that we're good friends with and, and big fans of. Um, I guess moving on to investment policy and investments then, um, let's spend a little bit of time talking about uh, our relationship and uh, what you get out of uh, integrating with our fixed term fund platform and the reasons why you adopted it in the first place and the use cases for taking it forward. So I think, um, I think if I remember rightly, you and John Bentley, I had a sales, had, um, had known each other for some time going all the way back. And then John and I came and talked to you, gosh, was it 18 months or so ago? I think it was. Yeah. What we were building. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, maybe just give a little bit of information as to, to why you onboarded, why you think that the platform, why you thought that the platform might be helpful at the time that we were talking to you. Yeah, as, as, as you say, John and I have uh, known each other for many, many years. It's a small world in the, in the treasury space, as I think we all know. So uh, when John approached us all those months ago and, and gave me the elevator pitch, as it were, as to what Treasury Spring could bring forward. Uh, I was very interested. I mean, we we've been sitting on a cash position for some for some time now, and and really been um, investing our cash in a in a fairly stable manner, using very conventional investment instruments, uh, and not really straying outside of our comfort zone. And really, um, I wanted to see what else was out there. So John's approach was actually very timely in that respect. And we'd never really considered the repo market. Um, at the time, we considered it to be really the preserve of much larger organizations, uh, and, and there was you know, many ob obstacles to accessing that type of market. Obviously, the Treasury Spring solution helps to, to break down some of those obstacles and, and, and opens up a whole different asset class, really, to, to, to corporates of the size of hunting. Um, you know, exposure that really wouldn't have been available to us without you know, significant investment otherwise. Um, so it's been a, it's been a really successful journey thus far and, and has really delivered on that initial objective. And so, initially, so back then you were investing in bank deposits and, and money market funds and Correct. obviously we sort of saw 
yields um, decrease across both of those products, you know, down to kind of zero in, um, in money market funds mostly. I mean, sterling and dollars more or less, maybe a few basis points in dollars. Um, but it wasn't just yields that was driving you to make a change. Well, you sort of, you've mentioned the adoption of credit benchmark and you've mentioned some of your concerns around um, credit and both back then and coming out of the market as well. To what extent was the, the pitch internally, I guess, uh, we can make some extra basis points versus we can um, reduce our risk and, and, and better risk adjusted returns. It was all of the above. I mean, the, the idea of being able to slightly diversify away from the assets that we've already talked about uh, and the fact that those, the yield profile on some of those investment strategies was, was starting to contract as well, obviously meant that we needed to expand uh, our options a little bit. And yes, absolutely. The, the, the treasury spring offering, particularly in the secured financial issuances that come through the platform where you have a collateralized position, obviously ticks the box straight away in terms of that uh, security component, having a secured investment uh, that, that, that's collateralized by high grade assets in the background was really one of the strongest selling points that we, that we had to, to leverage when talking to the investment committee at Hunting. So it really was important that we, we stressed how that had been structured. Um, so yeah, that diversification uh, without sacrifice uh, and, and better positioning from a, from a credit standpoint without sacrificing yield and in some cases actually picking up a few basis points in a very low yielding environment was, was uh, really a win-win situation. Um, and obviously we've got the three verticals on the platform. We've got the bank vertical, which we've talked about a little bit, where we provide um, principally secured exposure to offering people much easier access to the repo market than they would otherwise have, as well as selectively some unsecured exposures, but only where we see uh, real risk-adjusted merit to, to offering those unsecured exposures. Yeah, on the sort of the, the even more secure side of the platform, we offer access to the government markets, so government bills, um, short-dated bonds, whatever. I know it's not something that you've you've um, invested in right now, but to what extent was it helpful that you know, in terms of that pitch to the investment committee, that there is an escape hatch, there's a route mm -hmm. if, for whatever reason, you know, you were working through Lehman, as was I, um, at March last year, felt a pretty sketchy space um, in terms of short-term bank funding and some of the things that we saw with money market funds uh, and liquidity concerns kind of all played into that. Um, to what extent is it helpful that you know that you've got that um, you know, that trap door, if you like, to, to go, okay, I'm, I want to go completely risk off. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that it's already, um, we're already onboarded onto the platform and we don't need to do anything else in order to have access to uh, those, those government offerings is, is a really powerful message. As you say, it's not something that we've invested in right now because you know, the, the market conditions don't necessarily require us to do that. Um, but as our cash position grows and we look to further diversify, and indeed, as you say, if there's any periods of, of market stress that, uh, as you, that, that indicate a risk off strategy that would, would make sense, then being able to very quickly move over from our current strategy and into a perhaps government based solution uh, is, is a very in, um, comforting thing to know that we have that at our disposal. And without having to go through any more KYC or onboarding process, um, it's really a very powerful story to be able to tell to my investment committee and, and you know, all the way up to, to board level to say that if we need to find a home for our cash, we have the, the channels open to us to do that. And then sort of taking the other side, if, you, if we're sort of really pushing the innovation um, agenda a little bit as far as our platform goes, you know, one of the things that we've really believed in ever since we came up with the idea for, for building our fixed term fund platform over five years ago now, was this idea that um, large corporates should also have the ability, the piping, the gateway to invest excess liquidity in other investment grade corporations that, you know, if you've got exposure only to the banking system, you're really missing out both on a risk perspective because, you know, most corporations have business models that are much less correlated to the banking sector than the banks themselves. Um, so you're getting diversification and reduction of risk through that. You know, you've also got corporations who are very counter cyclical um, uh, and so operate in a very different way to, to, to the way the banks are and of course there's normally additional return from going directly to an underlying investment grade corporation and providing them with short dated financing uh, 
How do you think about that? I know, um, I know you're sort of not there yet internally in terms of approval processes, but do you think, how do you think about that market going forward? And, and I guess, how do you think about the risks and returns of those investment opportunities? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. And again, the Treasury Spring platform is unique as I understand it in the way that it opens that world up to corporates of a size that would typically limit them in terms of access to that type of business to business uh, transaction. Um, I think there's there's a lot of scope there. I think disintermediation has been a theme for many years within the financial market space. Uh, I think corporate to corporate lending is is an area that will expand over time. Um, as you say, there's benefits there to both the uh, the, the borrower and the lender in in this instance. Uh, we're not quite there yet with our adoption of that. We have looked at it and um, we know that we have access to to that um, part of the uh, of the market as and when our own investment committee warms up to the idea. Uh, but for the time being, it's not something that we're ready to, to, to get into in too big a way. Um, but I think in terms of a risk return basis, you know, if you, if you break it down to its simplest terms, the large corporates that are issuing through this platform, um, uh, they, they represent a very good credit profile compared to even some of the financial institutions that, that, are, that, are, uh, that we lend to. And so I think there's definitely scope to, to expand into that area for sure. Yeah, no, we think it's exciting and um, there's lots more to come in that space from us, definitely. Um, so uh, we've talked a bit about what you've done uh, all the way back and what you've done kind of more recently in COVID. Uh, any uh, initiatives for the future? Any things on the, uh, the agenda for, um, for the rest of 2021 and beyond in terms of innovation? There's always lots on the go. Um, we try not to stand still for too long. Um, but again, going back to my earlier comments, it's trying to find solutions for for, for real problems. Uh, I, some of the things that we're looking at at the moment, um, are, are we're looking at layering in some, some AI capability, both in terms of our cash flow forecasting capabilities. Um, we are uh, hoping to enhance our order to cash efficiencies as well, also embracing the, the AI functionality that's coming through uh, a, a new implementation of our ERP platform. So this will be the first time that we've really integrated treasury processes with the group-wide ERP solution. So it's a very exciting time for us, and we're hoping to really leverage the, the investment that's been made in, in the ERP. Um, going back to the, the SWIFT connectivity that we've got, we're um, hopeful that this year we'll be able to deploy some real-time position analysis for the treasury center, uh, as well as layering in some auto-reconciliation as well. So. That will allow us to, to log into our TMS in the morning and have a true real-time dynamic uh, view of our cash position around the world. And we'll be able to use AI and other features to determine what sort of treasury processes stem from that, be it settlements or FX management or, or whatever it happens to be. So it's, it's really building on from uh, implementations that have already been made, investment that's already been made. But back to my earlier point, it's understanding what evolution is coming through uh, from our existing vendors and, and, and partners to develop and build out the, the technology that we've already got in place. And there's advantages there. Uh, we've got relationships with these guys already. Um, the management team within Hunting identifies and, and recognizes their capabilities. So the internal process is a little bit more streamlined as opposed to going out to a, to a new vendor for the first time, which is always going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, so, yeah, lots of interesting things coming through, Kevin. Yeah, and I think the thing that I find most impressive about the way that you guys have operated it is if you, you look, it all sort of fits together, as, as I was sort of alluding to earlier. So you've got you know, good cash flow visibility that you've got through SWIFT and good payments infrastructure, and then you're working on the cash flow forecasting so that you know when the money's going to come into that um, those visibility tools. And obviously you've implemented us so that you've got a broad range of cash investment options available to you that you wouldn't otherwise have had. And then you add on top of that credit benchmark so that you can properly assess the credit exposures that you've got through those um, different cash investment tools and then also sort of back through the supply chain. And you know, when you put it together, it makes for a pretty high performance treasury, I think. So, um, oh, it's yeah. nice of you to say so. Thanks, um, Kevin. Now, we're, we're very pleased yeah. how it's all come together and uh, there's always ways to improve, but at the moment it's performing well and um, happy to share it with you. No, and thanks very much for taking the time. So, um, uh, just a bit under a minute left. Uh, one question that did come in through the audience, topical one, uh, was can you see uh, any ESG data on the Treasury Spring platform? Question we get asked a lot 
um, we've thought a lot about how best to display what is at the moment still a slightly disparate set of ESG data, but there will be a release coming soon, uh, if not in the next um, month and certainly in the month after that, where clients will be able to start getting ESG visibility um, on exposures through the platform and it's something very much that is at top of our mind because it's top of our clients' minds. So. Um, uh, with that, uh, all that remains is for me to thank Chris very much for your time and for sharing your experiences with, um, with the audience. Um, you can, uh, if you want to watch the session again or if you want to forward it to your colleagues, it will be available on demand uh, for 30 days after the event, after the end of today. Um, and um, please do go visit us at our virtual exhibition stand. Thanks very much. <laughs>